Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I will be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our forever long series about the origins of life. Today's topic is going to be phylogeny. So like always, let me get you your objectives, and then we'll go ahead and get on into our lesson. So four objectives today. First one, understand the Linnaean system of naming and classification. Second one, understand the concept of phylogeny. Third, interpret a phylogenetic tree. And finally, discuss how the phylogeny of an organism is determined. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get going. Starting out with what is phylogeny? Now phylogeny is just a term, so I will give you the definition and we can leave it at that. Phylogeny is simply the evolutionary history of an organism. So where did that organism come from in terms of animals that it may have evolved from? On the right hand side there, you see a bunch of different primates with some branches connecting them all together. That would be the phylogeny or the evolutionary history of the different primates that we now have on the world or on the planet today. We'll talk about how these trees are used and constructed in a moment, but just for now in your head make the connection, connection phylogeny is evolutionary history. Before we get into phylogeny though we need to talk about the origins of classification or grouping things together. Scientists have always really enjoyed grouping things together. It's something they find necessary to do. I find it boring, but you know, it's probably one of those things that is pretty important. So there's a guy named Carolus Linnaeus, and he developed the first really solid classification system. And it's one that is still used by many scientists today. What he did is he took organisms and based them or he took organisms and grouped them together based on similar characteristics. Now obviously today we can do this using DNA sequencing. It's much more exact, but when he did it, he did it based on what he could see. As he was grouping these organisms together, he came up with this big hierarchy. Hierarchy just means that bigger groups are situated above smaller groups, and you can think of it almost as being like a funnel where your biggest, most inclusive category is up here, and then you narrow down to your smallest, most exact category. Here's a system right here. Life we're not going to worry about because obviously we know we are classifying the living world. So these are the ones to worry about. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. The way I remember this little acronym, Dumb King Philip came over for good soup. All right. Domain is the biggest, most inclusive. This would be like the top of the funnel right here. You dump all living things on the earth into domain, and then you start sifting them down through the funnel until you get one specific animal down here at the bottom, and that would be at the species level. Now, something to recognize is that each of these bigger categories is made up of these smaller categories. So, for example, domain is made up of several different kingdoms. A kingdom is made up of several different phyla, Phylum is made up of several different classes. Class is made up of several different orders. Order is made up of several different families. And then we've got a genus and a species. Obviously, a genus is made up of several different species. Now, out of this system that Linnaeus put together, he also came up with his naming system because scientists need a common way to communicate the, I don't know, what an organism is, obviously. Scientists around the world speak a ton of different languages, so they need a common way to communicate this is what this animal is, this is what that animal is. So we use binomial nomenclature, which uses the genus and the species to show what an animal is. So an example, the common wolf is Canis lupus. Canis is the genus name, species is the species name, obviously, or lupus is the species name. So Canis denotes that this organism is a canine, meaning that it's related to the dog in your house and a wolf and a coyote and a fox, etc. Lupus denotes that it is a wolf. So this is the broader category. This is the specific organism. And that's basically how binomial nomenclature works. We are Homo sapiens. So we mentioned just a moment ago phylogeny being evolutionary history. Now, phylogenies are shown using a phylogenetic tree. I probably should have chosen a better graphic, but I like pretty things. So this one on the right is an old phylogenetic tree, and I will kind of show you some things that you need to be able to recognize on a phylogenetic tree regardless of what it looks like. Now, phylogenetic trees show common ancestry and descent. So every time the tree branches, that represents a last common ancestor. So for example, on this tree, 
right here, this one point right here represents the last common ancestor between these three broad groups on the tree. This right here represents a common ancestor between everything that branches off from it. Same for this one and same for this one. Um, as you run away from these, obviously you are going from more primitive organisms to more complex or at least present living species. Usually as you move along a phylogenetic tree you are moving through time so this would have been much further back in history. This would represent a more modern species or organism. Um, organisms that are on the same branch are generally very closely related to each other though they are not similar. So like right here you see little tiny branch, these two organisms would be related to each other, but they're not going to be the exact same. So if we were to go over here in Animalia, you could have on this little branch, this could be the apes, this could be humans. Our last common ancestor would be right there. So just recognize that relationship is being shown. Branch points represent a last common ancestor. And usually as you move from, usually you'll see these set up in a different pattern, something like this and usually the oldest or I don't know yeah the oldest organism is going to be back here the most present day form is going to be up there so our next topic on constructing phylogenetic trees is morphological homology now these phylogenetic trees are usually constructed using homologies things that are similar between two organisms now when a tree is being constructed, a very important distinction needs to be made between homology and analogy. If you remember back to when we were talking about evolution months and months ago, a homologous structure is a structure that has got a similar structure, but the function may be different. The example that's always used for this is four limbs in mammals. The bone structure of our arm is very similar to the bone structure of a bat's wing, but obviously those two structures have different functions. Analogous structures are structures that have a similar function, but the structure internally is very different. An example of an analogous structure is found on the right there. You've got a bat wing, a bird wing, and an insect wing. They all have the purpose of enabling the organism to fly, but if you look at them, the internal structure is very, very different and not really comparable. The reason this is important is if we are looking at evolutionary history, it's important for a scientist to recognize homologous structures because homologous structures, since they show a common structure, are more likely to be evolutionarily related than are analogous structures. So analogous structures may have been developed three different times in response to the same need. So three different ancestral organisms needed the ability to fly. One branch of those evolved wings and you get birds. The other one evolved a different set of wings and you get bats. And the third one a completely different way and evolved the membranous wings that we see in insects. So flight was needed in three different organisms, but there were three different strategies for getting there. So when a scientist is putting together a phylogenetic tree, they have to be able to recognize what structures or what behaviors are homologous, showing common evolutionary relationship and which ones are analogous might have the same function but are not evolutionarily related to one another thankfully 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 scientists have gotten to the point where they can actually compare DNA sequences we've talked a lot about DNA mutation but there's the basic idea that as with homologous structures homologous DNA sequences show evolutionary relationship obviously if an organism has got a bunch of similar bases in a gene it is probably related to another organism that has a bunch of similar bases in the same gene over time um, genetic sequences pick up mutations those mutations are what make one organism different from another but if a scientist is trying to determine which organisms are related, they can take those genes, lay them next to each other, compare the DNA sequences, and that comparison can show them with some accuracy how closely related two organisms are. Furthermore, it can give some ideas about how long ago two organisms diverged from one another. Obviously, the more mutations that are found between the two base sequences or the two gene sequences that they're comparing, 
the further back in history those two organisms diverge from each other. So the more closely related two organisms are, the more similar their DNA is going to be. And the further apart they are, the less similar their DNA is going to be. Thankfully, we've got computer programs that are able to take care of most of the sequencing and comparison work for us. And that was a mouthful. This was the first video back. It's been a long time, and this one was tough, but hopefully it helped you out a little bit understanding phylogeny and phylogenetic trees. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.